On this episode of Outlook TV, reporter Connie Smudge covers the Queen's Care annual gala evening fundraiser. Fred Camperman attends the Gay Men's Health Summit to examine issues that are affecting gay men's health. Michael Venus brings us the Teaches of Peaches. Ray Clark stops by the Fly Girls event, Hershey Bar. Jack Fox interviews Biff Naked. Stephen Schelling tells you what's hot this year in menswear when he interviews a master tailor. Skylar Bear gets down at the Prairie Fairies Fowl Supper. Angus Prod had a fantastic time on Granville Island at the Starry Night event. Hello and welcome to Outlook TV. We are Canada's only coast-to-coast -coast queer news magazine show and we have got a whole lineup of new stories for you starting right now. I'm Dan Doomshaw. And I'm Rebecca Wyman. First of all, we'd like to congratulate our southern neighbours on passing some fabulous legislation recently. That's right, they are moving towards marriage equality and we'd like to recognize these states for groundbreaking new legislation in the last election. Minnesota. Maine. Maryland. Washington. Way to go, guys. Our first story is about queens. Queens who care, and we have found out that they actually do. Well, I never thought otherwise. But anyway, we sent Connie Smudge in to Queen's Care. That's right, she's our queen, and we sent her to this gala evening <laughs> to figure out why they were raising funds and what all this fabulous hubbub is all about. Connie. Oh, hi, kittens. It's your intrepid reporter, the unstoppable Connie Smudge, reporting for Outlook TV here in the heart of the Davie Village. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I am at the junction, and I cannot wait because we're here for Queen's Care 5. Please tell us what we're doing here. Well, um, uh, five years ago, I realized that I wasn't doing a particularly great job of keeping uh, the name of my dear departed sister, Diana Rose, alive, and I thought it was about time I said something to change that. So we did... Uh, the first Queen's Care here in this very room, and, uh, and it was great, and it, it honored her. And that night, DJ Jules was our DJ, and sadly, we lost him as well. So now this is an evening not only in honor of our late great friend Diana Rose, but also in honor of our friend uh, Jules. Tell me how this impacts your life. Well, I'm just so happy to be a part of something that raises money for something so dear and near to us in honor of our friends, and it's great because as we all know, drag queens are the pioneers of fundraising in this community and a lot of communities. So it's great to have all the queens out donating their time and their fun, their talent for charity. So it makes me feel wonderful to be a part of it. I am here with the amazing Coco, Regent Empress 41. How you doing, girl? I am fantastic. Aren't you just so honored and so happy to be proud of this like fabulous evening? I love to do this show. It's always a great show, and it's remembering to amazing. Thank you for showing up. I know that we're all honored you're here. Tell me what Queen's Care means to you. What an enormously charitable bunch of people the queens are and how much have they done for people suffering with HIV and AIDS. I'll support anything the girls do. Well, my darling kittens, that was another extravagant evening here in Vancouver. Queens Care 5 was amazing. There were performers, there was glamour, there was drag, there was talent, and there was a lot of love and charity. I'm so happy you joined us. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I am your intrepid reporter, the unstoppable Connie Smudge, reporting for Outlook TV. Oh, yeah. So Dan, I've been wondering, how many times can I say barebacking before you get all nervous and blush? One. <laughs> <laughs> this month, our producer Fred Camperman went to SFU, Simon Fraser University, to a gay men's health summit where... I'm going to say it because you can't. Uh, they were discussing whether barebacking in gay porn encourages barebacking in life. I can say barebacking. Barely. Fred. We're here at Simon Fraser University at the BC Men's Gay Health Summit. They're taking in a look at and reconsidering the social determinants that affect gay men's health today. Gay Men's Health Summit is an annual conference. This is the eighth year of the conference. So this is a conference that brings together gay men, gay men advocates, researchers, and people working in public health over two days to discuss 
you know, new trends and new uh, prevention strategy for um, gay men's health. There's a wide variety of workshops over the two days. I caught up with Jody Jollymore from him about his. The presentation was called Barebacking Porn Hegemony and the Rise of Condomless Sex in Porn. And the goal, it started a couple of months ago when Robin Perry and I from Community got together and we were talking about an article that we read about barebacking porn. And as you may or may not know, there's an increase in barebacking porn. There's a lot more condomless porn that's happening either online or porn studios are making it as well. And we're wondering if there's an impact on people's behavior, whether or not watching porn uh, impacts behavior. There are arguments against that, there are arguments for it, and today we were really trying to explore some of those and determine whether or not as public health advocates and people who are interested in strengthening gay men's health, whether or not we needed to do something about barebacking porn or continue discussing it. Does condom fatigue have an effect on gay men's behaviour? I'm not sure the condom fatigue exists. There's still over 60% of guys who use condoms regularly. Over 70% use them for uh, sex with casual partners. So there may be more condomless sex going on, but there may also be a lot more monogamous relationships or a lot more negotiated safety that's going on. Negative guys still don't want HIV. When they're asked about HIV, they still have very negative perceptions of it. And, and I would say they're not optimistic about HIV, so it's the opposite of treat, uh, treatment and heart optimism. Uh, what we do find is that guys are less fearful of HIV, which is different than being optimistic about it. And, uh, and guys are less fearful because of medications, and, and that's okay. Does bareback porn influence gay men's sexual behavior? I would say it's inconclusive. The jury's still out as to whether or not porn impacts behavior. We're not sure if it impacts behavior, but we definitely know it impacts knowledge. There, uh, plenty of studies that say that young gay men, in the absence of sexual education in school and, and from their peers, turn to pornography for sexual education. Now whether or not they then act all of that out, um, it's more difficult to tell. But we definitely know young gay men learn their sexual practices from porn. And if they're watching a lot of a particular type of porn, it could very well influence them or not. For Outlook TV, I'm Fred Camperman. Well, now that Dan is all hot and bothered, we're going to have to take a little bit of a break. Yeah, get yourself a snack and join us back here for some more great queer shows. Hi, I'm Biff Naked, and you're watching Outlook TV right here in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Welcome back. You're watching Outlook TV. And we're going to take you now to Toronto and our reporter, Michael Venus. Michael Venus caught up with electronic musician and performance artist, Peaches to learn about the teaches of peaches. Hi, this is Michael Venus. I'm here in Toronto, Ontario for the Toronto International Film Festival. I'll be talking to electro goddess, multimedia artist, Peaches, where she debuted her very first feature film, Peaches Does Herself. It's a, a film, a stage production based on 20 of my songs as an anti-jukebox musical. Um, there's no dialogue, uh, the music uh, propels the action mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a fantastical and magical biography. And who's Sandy? Sandy Kane? Sandy Kane. Yeah. Um, she's like, you know, um, an older, awesome stripper comedian okay. and um, you may know her from such hits as uh, Gloria, her, her rendition of Gloria. She has an access cable TV show. And um, I see her as either, if, if, I, if I was her age, maybe I would have been her if mm -hmm. I was trying to do what I'm doing now, or uh, that's my future. I brought 18 cast members. 18 also, people. Also, um, the very um, beautiful Danny Daniels. And who's she? A beautiful transsexual, perfect body in every way. And do you plan on doing any more films, or what do you think? Is there more films for you down the road? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see what's going on. Well, you've been doing a lot of sort of theater stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, I sang um, Orfeo, the, the role of Orfeo in the production of L'Orfeo, Monteverdi's Orfeo, which was the first production where they said, this is what opera is. I did um, Peaches Christ Superstar, which was a one-woman um, rendition, and doing the whole Jesus Christ Superstar, but as a one-woman show. But not like, Jesus! Wait, wait, not like that. <laughs> but you know, all the songs are just singing them to the audience, and that was amazing. But then, uh, and Chili Gonzalez uh, performed the whole orchestration on piano. Now, where can people learn more about you and maybe see the trailer to your film? And 
Um, Peaches does herself, the trailer, you can see it, you know, online. Um, my, you can go to my website, uh, Peaches Rocks, like R-O-C-K-S, rocks.com, or, uh, you know, tweet me, Facebook me, I don't know. <laughs> do all those things you do. You'll find me. Yay, thank you so much. <laughs> Shank on, Shank on. And now to the club scene. Here's something I've never heard of, Fly Girls and the Hershey Bar. Never? No. No. Well, Fly Girl Productions is a pair of lesbians who put on parties in town, and Hershey Bar is spelled H-E-R-S-H-E, -E, her, oh, her she, she, and they have those every long weekend. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, we sent Ray Clark to check it out, and she got an interview with the producer, Mandy. Since 2001, Fly Girl Productions has earned an international reputation for being one of the leading lesbian event organizers in North America. We love the work that we do. It creates this community of all kinds of women. That's how we run our business. That's how our business relationships are made. That's what we extend when we open the doors to everyone that walks in. To create that sort of vibe, where you feel, no matter how you dress up, no matter what you look like, no matter what you're wearing, it's, it's all okay. Hershey is a great place to come. Um, I bring all my friends, we dance, we play pool. Um, yeah, and I think it's just a good place to be who you are. How did Hershey affect the community? We were looking to bring women out of uh, sort of the sketchy parts of town and we wanted them to experience spaces that they felt proud to be in and felt safe. Our key thing with the DJ is uh, technical skills and stage presence but really really know how to mix. How did you get into event planning? I studied project management. It was um, I was doing fundraising um, at Doctors Without Borders um, so, you know, it's, uh, it was a natural sort of extension. I have a very um, creative and uh, analytical brain. I like organizing things. <laughs> what is your advice for other young lesbian entrepreneurs? Be yourself. You have one life and this is yours. Um, don't waste it. You really have to live it for yourself. Ask for help. Reach out to people. There's so many organizations. Just even start volunteering. This has been Ray Clark for Outlook TV, Vancouver. And now to music. <laughs> I'm not singing. I'm just going to tell you that our reporter Jack Fox got the thrill of a lifetime when he got to interview Biff Naked. I was thrilled to have the opportunity to chat with Biff about her experience with breast cancer and her queer identity. I self-identified as a bisexual girl when I was about 20. At that time in my life, it was very important to me. Very important to me. The label was very important to me. And now, 20 years later, I kind of laugh at my idealistic self because what wound up happening was every bisexual, quote unquote, that I met when I was a young woman uh, was incredibly promiscuous or promoting promiscuity. Not just according to her lyrics, Biff tells me how she has been unlucky in love. Well, I've had one official husband, 11 fiancés, and one unofficial um, husband. And uh, I think that those have all not worked and they've all been men. So now I think moving forward, I'm starting to kind of gravitate again towards, uh, you know, my own, my own kind. Despite their religious beliefs, Biff's parents have always been very supportive. My father is convinced uh, that I'm a lesbian since I was five years old. Um, uh, al although uh, I wrote about it in Huffington Post Gay Voices, uh, I have a piece called Whisker Water that is the story of me asking my dad um, when I was a little kid what a lesbian was. And he was just very, my parents have always been extremely matter of fact uh, with me regarding my sexuality, regarding society's take on sexuality and, uh, and uh, queer love and everything. My parents kind of look at it all the same. And my father is very proud uh, to be a member of the United Church of Canada, particularly because the ministers are gay. He loves that. As the song goes, we're not going to take it. She certainly has not in regards to her battle with cancer. My health crisis was trumped by uh, a relationship crisis. 
that I was going through at the time. So I was in a brand new relationship and then diagnosed. Uh, so that was very, um, uh, very interesting circumstances. And what happened, I noticed, was that it forced me into basically uh, keeping myself very busy. So kind of trying to outrun all of the stress I was experiencing. And I threw myself into volunteering with the cancer group I was also in. If volunteering and recovering from cancer weren't enough, Biff laid down two albums in the beginning of a book. So I've been working on a book for two years because I was forced into it, basically. I have a manager. Uh, but I handwrite. So as a result, it's a very slow process, you know, and, uh, and, I, and I enjoy that process. So I always say Michael Crichton takes eight years to make a book. Eight years. You're going to wait eight years, people. I don't care. Wait, wait as much. It'll be worth it. But actually, it'll probably be out in the next year and a half. For Outlook TV, this is Jack Fox here in Vancouver. Well, we went to the doctor, and she looked at the x-ray. You know what she said, Rebecca? It's time for a break. It's time for a break. I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> I can't get. Hi, and welcome back. And we are going to take you now to fashion. Strike a pose. Chante Chasse. Our fashion reporter, Stephen Schelling, met up with master tailor Christine Brand at the Shangri-La to find out what is trending this season in menswear and fashion. And one thing I think is going to be trending, jackets like these. This is a fabulous jacket. Feel that. Jersey. Nice. It's a t-shirt blazer. We'll see if it makes the cut in this next segment where, Stephen, you better work. Summer's gone and fall is here, so it might be time to go into that closet and take a look at those tank tops and jean cutoffs and switch them out for something a little bit more professional. In order to do that, we're here today at the Shangri-La Hotel for the Baracos and Brand pop-up shop, where you're gonna learn everything you need to know about finding a new suit. a little bit about what you're doing here today. So today is our pop-up custom fit suit event and the idea really is to bring our customers uh, from, from the North Shore that usually work downtown, bring our suits to them. How long have you been working in menswear? 24 years. And where did you start? I actually started for Asher Menswear. Uh, Fred Asher was a, a chain out of the East. And when did Baracos and Brand open? So we just opened one month ago. And before that, it was the men's room. And I was a partner in the men's room with, with John Clark. And he's retired now. We've decided to close the business at the end of July, rebrand, and open up as Baracus and Brand. What exactly is a custom fit suit? So a custom fit suit is a suit that is, well, there's two, point, two parts to a custom fit suit. Um, that's actually a tailored suit off the rack is one and then a custom made suit is uh, one where we take your measurements and make it to your specifications. This season we're doing this narrower lapel. One thing to keep in mind when you buy a suit with a narrower lapel is you match your tie width to the narrow lapel. As you move down the jacket another uh, sort of old wives tie that is a pet peeve of mine is that the length of a suit jacket should be the length of your arm with your hands cupped under and that's not true every season jackets they, they vary in length this season happens to be a little bit shorter and as you can see Daryl is wearing uh, one of the big trends this season that's the colorful sock and if he really wanted to show those colorful socks off he'd have his pants a tiny bit shorter So the trend this season for sports jackets are things like, like the lining of the inside of the pocket becomes a puff. Here's another trend that's, that's really big this year and that is the overcheck. With a few tips and tricks, you too can make fall your strong suit. This is Stephen Schelling for Outlook TV.
Well, an annual tradition in Vancouver is the Prairie Fairies Fowl Supper. So we sent our reporter Skylar Bear to check it out. We sent him to the hoedown to get the lowdown. It's a prairie style hoedown. I am so excited to be back reporting at the 13th annual Prairie Fairy Fowl Supper. I said that one time. I am so happy. Last time it took me like three tries. How's everybody? Holy hell, there's lots of you. Squeeze in. There's people looking for seats. Hi. You look great, by the way. Thank you. Arizona's been very good to you. Arizona is good. There's something about a dry climate for a wet woman that keeps you sort of together. The event seems to be getting bigger and better each year. Every year we say, oh, I think they're drinking more than last year too. But really, there's only so many drinks they can drink. But yeah, there's lots of people, 750 people, uh, about 100 volunteers and performers, about another 50. So we've got lots of folks in here. Where else do you also go where there's 20-year-old gay guys and 90-year-old grandmothers and their aunts and their uncles and their sisters and their brothers and we have people who fly here from all over Canada to come to this crazy event. And so it makes me feel good that there's something that draws these people together, a sense of community and liquor and turkey that uh, I guess strikes a chord. Now, absolutely nothing, not even her age, stops the youthful spirited gal from throwing on a show. I'm 78, I'll be 79 in December, next year 80. How many more years have I got? Mm, we'll see, but yeah, we'll be here. We're gonna be here. Bill, it's pretty hard to keep going without me, but you know, there's certain things I could just prop up a doll or something and keep going. So yeah, I don't think they'd have a show. These people have nothing without me. That's the thing I've been telling them for years. Without me, they have nothing. What, Turkey, who's gonna do that? All the funds raised at the Fowl Supper proudly go to three major beneficiaries of tonight's event. A Loving Spoonful, McLaren Housing, and Out in Schools. We are thrilled to be a beneficiary of tonight's event. There are over 700 people here. It's so exciting. And we expect to raise over $35,000, which means we can buy a lot of meals for people living with HIV and AIDS. For us to be able to partner with an organization like the Fillmore family, that's absolutely amazing. Over the past couple of years, McLaren's benefited. We've received over $100,000 through our partnership with them and through their fundraising efforts, and that truly is absolutely remarkable. It goes a long way to providing a safe housing for people living with HIV and AIDS. It raises some money to help our programs, which uh, which reach a lot of high school students around the province and, and uh, send a message of acceptance, uh, queer acceptance across high schools in, in BC. And of course, everyone is having a blast. Instead of having parties and a bunch of other things, come here and have a party and do something for charity for somebody else. Absolutely, it's a great cause. Yeah, yeah. Are you full to have some dinner? Oh yeah, I'm stopped. Yeah, we need to start dancing this off pretty soon, I think. <laughs> yeah. For Outlook TV, this is Skylar Bear reporting at the Prairie Ferry Fowl Supper. So Dan, do you know what's been happening here in Vancouver for 27 years now? Uh, bike lanes being built. Ooh, good one. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Starry Night Gala. Ah, oh, the Starry Night Gala on Granville Island. Yes, that's the one. We sent Angus Prot there this year to check it out. We're on Granville Island in front of the Arts Club Theatre for the 27th annual Starry Night. Let's go inside. Starry, starry night Paint your palette blue We're here with Kendra Sprinkling, the executive director of the Shooting Stars Foundation for the 27th annual Starry Night. Can you tell us a little bit about the Starry Night and the Shooting Star Foundation? Sure, I can give you a little history. 27 years ago today, we started in this very venue at the Arts Club, and um, we're so happy to be back here on a Saturday night. And um, it is one of six events that the Shooting Stars Foundation does. And who do we have performing with us tonight? Oh, a bevy of beauties. We have Jane Mortify. We have a new uh, up-and-coming singing named Dahara September. Um, Long John Baldry's past leader, John Lee Sanders, is here. The Cover Me Canada, one of the finalists, Warren Dean Flanders, is here. Jane Mortify, uh, the lovely Sybil Thrasher. You have to have the lovely Sybil Thrasher. I hear Patrick Massey's here tonight. He is. Great. Will you be able to introduce him? Oh, I certainly hope so. He's singing a spectacular song from his new CD called Mend the Man. Uh, many people don't, maybe don't know that you were one of the first openly gay male country western singers in Canada to come out and, and yeah. wondering if that has had any effect on your career. 
Um, you know, early on when I was told not to talk about it, um, it was, I, I think, more challenging. And when I came to terms with it and came out publicly in 2004, I've had more opportunities. I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> We're honored tonight to be able to introduce Bernard Cuffling, who's the host of Starry Night, and also is a well-known actor, director, and inductee into the BC Hall of Fame. That sounds nice. <laughs> That's what I say. I can't get. No. Hey, hey, no, no, hey, hey. Now, you said you've met many famous people here mm -hmm. at Starry Night. Can you name a few for us? Well, uh, for me, the highlight, because uh, being a stage actor, was uh, Sir Ian McKellen and Maureen Forrester, the amazing contralto. It's the quality we have here, and, and the singers, and it's the heart that goes into it, and, and the variety. Uh, it, it's just fantastic. For Outlook TV, this is Angus Pratt. Well, that's the end of our show today. We've certainly packed another episode full of queer stories. We have, it's true, but it's not over yet. You can still like us on Facebook, you can follow us on Twitter, all the social media. That's right, be in touch. Suggest a story that you'd like us to cover or volunteer with us. We're always looking for more hands to help. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Rebecca Wyman. And I'm Dan Doomshaw. We'll see you next time on Outlook TV.